Welcome. Today we'll talk about the second lecture in this uh, course, and the lecture is called The Early Renaissance. Ah, yes, it, it's an exciting time. What is the Renaissance, after all? The word means rebirth, and uh, it is actually a period of time from about 1450 to 1550 in Italy, and that was the earliest part of the Renaissance. As we will talk about later, the Renaissance spread principally to the north, and we get an area called, or a period called the Northern Renaissance. The Renaissance, this rebirth, was the rebirth of classical Greek and Roman things, architecture, painting, concepts, studies, even language, because people were trying to relearn ancient Greek and read the great Greek dramas, for instance, and other things that came from ancient Greece and Rome. Here we can see two buildings. One, the ancient one, is the Pantheon in Rome. It's the best preserved of the ancient Roman buildings. The second is a uh, church called the Pazzi Chapel. It's in Florence. It was built during the Renaissance. Notice that they both have a Greek facade with a rotunda, Roman rotunda, behind. It shows the kind of copycat concepts that were prevalent in the Renaissance. But there was a lot of creativity. There were new things that came out in the Renaissance as well. It wasn't just a rehash of ancient Greece and Rome. One of the characteristics of the Renaissance was an idea or a concept of humanism. Humanism meant that humans were more important than, say, the church, which was the concept during the Middle Ages. The church dominated. Now we're starting to get people as an independent entity would be dominant in, in literature, in art. Less emphasis on the church, more emphasis on individual people. The Renaissance began in the city of Florence. Florence is a city in central Italy. And um, I want to tell you a little story. One, uh, one year, my wife and I were visiting Italy, and we had been down in Pisa. Pisa is about uh, 30 miles away toward the coast, toward the western coast of Italy. And we were seeing the Leaning Tower and the, and the cathedral in uh, Pisa, and, and it got to be quite late. And we had a, a, a schedule that we wanted to be in Florence for the next morning. And we decided that we would drive to Florence and we would get a hotel there. So we drove up the freeway, and as we got close to Florence, we saw a sign that said Florence Centro. That's usually the train station, and so that's a, a place that's often near the center of the city. And I had never been to Florence before, and so I said, well, I'll just follow those signs. And I got off the freeway, and it's, it's quite a little ways, several miles, from the freeway into the center of Florence. And when I got into the center of Florence, it was dark at 10 or 11 o'clock at night, and Florence is not a good city to try and drive in. Uh, the streets are very narrow. There's a lot of one-way streets. I, I even think that there are some one-way streets that are dead ends. Now, you think about how you get out of a one-way dead end street, and that's the confusion that I was in this night. So I turned a corner, and I saw a sign, and it said Savoy Hotel. I thought, wow, that'll be a great little place for me to stay. So I went into the Savoy Hotel, and as soon as I pulled up to the curb, there were, there were people surrounding the car. They'd open up the trunk. They took out the luggage. Um, they asked my wife and I to step out. A fellow got in the car and drove it away. And I said, where's he going? And they said, oh, he's just going to go park your car for you. And it disappeared. We went in. We checked in. We went up to our room. And as we got into our room, I opened the door. And there was a very lovely, beautiful tiled bathroom. And as I turned the corner, 
I went into the main bedroom part. There was a beautiful four-poster bed with a canopy and original Renaissance paintings on the wall. And I thought, this is really expensive. So I went and I looked at, looked at how much it was. I hadn't noticed, and part of the reason is that this is many years ago, it was in Lyra, and there were lots and lots of zeros when you look at Lyra. But I figured out what it was and I said, I don't care how much it is, we're going to stay here because I don't want to have to unpack, go get in the car, bring the car back, but it better be close to downtown Florence and I don't want to have to drive in the city anymore. The next morning at 7 o'clock, I heard a tremendous loud clanging and I opened up the window shutters and looked out and there, as you can see from this picture, was the bell tower on the central um, cathedral on the main cathedral in Florence and our hotel is in that little block of buildings just uh, facing the bell tower. It is the perfect place to be in Florence. Now while we're looking at this picture take a look at some of the other things that you will see. In front of the cathedral is a small octagonal building that is the baptistry. If you look toward the back, you can see two towers close to each other. Those towers are associated with the Piazza della Signoria, and that's the main square. And then if you look in the back, there is another church, and that church is one of the cathedrals, another cathedral in town. Uh, that's called Santa Croce. That's where famous people are buried. And then a little further back beyond that, you can see a river and that's the Arno River. So that's Florence as it looks today. It's a beautiful city and it is just loaded with Renaissance concepts. Here is the city hall, the, the Senoria, and as we're looking at it here in this picture you can see the main square. Uh, this is the place where the leaders of Florence met and they governed the city. The city, for much of the time that we will be discussing, was a republic. Now, the Republic of Florence was a little different than what we think of as a republic today. They didn't have a king, in that it's the same, but they did have a dominant family. This family, the Medici family, had become dominant through some very clever financial arrangements with the Catholic Church. There were other families in the city that were envious and jealous of the Medicis, but the Medicis were proud of Florence and they wanted to make it great, and therefore they dedicated civic power toward making Florence the greatest city in the world. This is much like um, happened in ancient Greece at the time of the Golden Age of Greece. So here was the creative idea. Let's figure out what we can do to enhance the reputation of Florence. And there was a problem. And the problem needed a creative solution. The problem was the cathedral. The people in Florence had built the cathedral, but they were unable to finish it. They had built the round, what we call the drum portion of the central rotunda, but no one could figure out how to put a dome on it. And therefore, the Medici family encouraged the city fathers to establish a contest for the establish or for the building of the cathedral dome. Even before then, they they decided that they would have a contest on the doors of the baptistry. Now here we see a little sketch. You see the octagonal baptistry and then the long square with the circle for the dome. These doors, and you can see them pictured here, are actually the doors that won the competition. That there were two competitions and these are the doors that won the second competition. Let's take a look at how it worked. See the little octagonal 
the competitions were always held on the doors that faced the cathedral. There were some doors there done by an artist named Pisano. They were moved to make room for the competition doors. Then, after the first competition was won by a man named Giberti, then those doors were moved and a second competition was held. That was also won by Giberti. We'll call that Giberti II, or as they were called by Michelangelo, the Gates of Paradise. These are the two, these are typical of the door centers, the decorations on Giberti I. The contest said that uh, artists were to submit a, a uh, cast door panel illustrating the sacrifice of Isaac. And here we see Gibertis on the left and a man named Brunleski on the right. Giberti won principally because his was a single piece. It had drama, it had uh, compositional issues that the judges thought was a little better. Now actually the committee that was to make the decision had a hard time deciding and originally they said that there would be co-winners and the two men were to work together. Brunleski was irate. He said, I will not work with anyone else. And he left, therefore forfeiting his portion of the prize. Giberti said, fine, I'll take it and I will do it. And he spent the next several years doing the first and the second because he won the second competition as well. And here's a picture of one of the panels from the second competition or as Michelangelo called it, the Gates of Paradise. Here we can see a panel depicting the life of Adam and Eve. It shows them uh, being uh, cast out into the world, setting up an altar, offering sacrifice. We see Cain and Abel with uh, Cain killing Abel. All of that together is one panel, somewhat larger than the earlier ones. Well, that set the scene for Florence to move forward. Now let's talk about this Medici dynasty, this family that created the impetus for progress. It began with a man named Giovanni. He had a son named Cosimo, and Cosimo was the one who, who created the great Medici bank and cemented the deal with the Pope to become the the Vatican's bank. When Cosimo died, his son Piero uh, took over, but Piero was sickly and did not live too long, and his son took over then. His son was named Lorenzo de' Medici, sometimes called Lorenzo the Magnificent. It was during Lorenzo's time that the culmination of the Renaissance occurred in Florence. Men like Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and uh, uh, Raphael were in Florence during the time of Lorenzo de' Medici. When Lorenzo died, his son Piero de' Medici, and we'll call him Piero II to distinguish from his grandfather, he took over and he was a weak ruler. And uh, after a few years lost power, he lost power to a man named Savonarola. Savonarola was not a Medici. He was uh, a priest, and we'll talk about him uh, toward the end of this lecture. Uh, after Savonarola, there was a republic reestablished, uh, and Machiavelli, a very famous writer, worked during the period of that republic. They were not part of the Medicis. They were independent and, in fact, enemies of the Medicis, and so then the Medicis uh, arranged to have one of the cousins made a pope, and that pope then attacked Florence and retook Florence for the Medici family. And he and his uh, cousin became the Medici popes, and they ruled for a brief period of time, and then they established a duchy of Florence, and it was ruled for the next 
couple of hundred years by a series of Medici dukes. We're going to be concerned with the first group of Medicis and Savonarola. The Medicis were really willing to take risks to gain power. They uh, backed a particular man to become pope. The man was successful and uh, he granted them certain favors as being the papal bank. That was part of what they were able to achieve. In some ways, the Medicis became like a mafia family where they could uh, say that something would be done and it would be done. The Medicis were, were not elected originally to any office. Uh, all the way through the time of Lorenzo the Magnificent, they didn't actually hold any political office at all, but they were very powerful. And you can believe that everything that was done of importance in Florence was done with the permission and the approval of the Medici family. Well, they wanted to have a great big project, and this is when they realized that their, their finances would be able to build this dome over the, over the drum. They'd finally be able to complete the cathedral, and therefore they started to look for someone who could do it, and they found someone. It was Brunelleschi, the fellow who was defeated in the earlier contest on the doors of the baptistry. Brunelleschi had gone to Rome, studied ancient Roman techniques for building, and had returned to Florence and became the choice to rebuild the cathedral. Let's take a look at this video and we can see uh, the concepts of Brunelleschi. For over a hundred years, a great, unfinished cathedral had loomed over Florence. The original planners had been overly ambitious. They had meant to build the largest dome in the world, and they had failed. Brunelleschi was brilliant. He's one of the greatest creativity thinkers and doers in the history of the world. Let's just spend a few moments talking about his first great creative work with respect to the cathedral. He conceived this double shell concept where the inner shell was strong enough to support the upper shell, not only for the completed cathedral, but during the construction as well. Marvelous concept. Um, I have to tell you that I've walked up to the top of the cathedral at Florence, and to get there you walk in between these shells sometimes. It's very, very interesting, very, very educational thing to do. The inner shell is fairly lightweight material for ease of construction, but it's strong enough to support that outer shell that is heavy and wind resistant. The ribs are kind of peaked, they're kind of gothic and they give added strength to the entire structure. Here's another uh, video that talks about other inventions that Brunelleschi had to achieve in order to build this wonderful dome. But the material that had been so carefully lifted still had to be moved laterally and then perfectly placed hundreds of feet in the air. To accomplish this seemingly impossible feat, Brunelleschi designed a second entirely new kind of hoist called a castello. Perched high on the cupola and resembling a gallows, it used a crossbeam and counterweight system, allowing builders to place material with millimetrical precision. So here are the two major inventions for the dome construction. The first is the reversing gear. So the horse or the oxen would go around in one direction and then when the, and that would, that would make the, the load go up and then when the load got to where it was they would flip a gear and the horse or oxen would continue in the same direction but the load would come down. So you have up and down simply by the switch of a gear. The other invention moved the material laterally. And that was very important because you needed to place it precisely. Here's an interesting thing about the lateral moving invention. It's actually the first patent ever issued. 
uh, Brunelleschi went to the city fathers in Florence and said, I have an invention that will help you unload ships down on the Arno River. But if I tell you about it, I have to be guaranteed that no one else will ever be able to benefit from it. So you have to protect me against copycats. And the city father said that they would do that, and therefore Brunelleschi was given the very first patent. And it was on the lateral placement device, which was used to unload ships down on the river. When you go down the stairs inside the cathedral dome, you'll find some places where they have this placement of bricks in a herringbone pattern. Very unusual, and I, I wondered why that would be the case. And I asked one of the guides, and they told me that the herringbone pattern gives additional strength, structural rigidity, to the, uh, to the dome. And I thought, wow, that's really an incredible invention in and of itself. How important is this dome? Well, take a look here. We've got the Florence Dome and then St. Peter's in Rome, St. Paul's in London, and the U.S. Capitol, to name just a few that have more or less copied the design of Brunelleschi's dome. Brunelleschi also did a beautiful chapel called the Pazzi Chapel. It's in another church, in, also in Florence. And I want you to just take a look at this chapel here with me. See that the chapel is very much in the classical Greek and Roman style. Notice the columns. They're, they're not full columns. They're just uh, decorations, but they're there to give the feel of the Greek and Roman style. Notice that there are semicircles and circles. This entire chapel is very, very clean and well organized. Just compare it with a Gothic chapel and you see the complexity and the angularness of the Gothic compared to the simplicity and the cleanness of the um, Renaissance. So in the Renaissance, people thought that the Gothic was uh, ugly. They didn't like that style. It was too, too gobbledygook, too messy. They enjoyed something cleaner and simpler, and um, they enjoyed the return to ancient Greece and Rome. Here's another concept that Brunelleschi developed. It's called perspective. It's absolutely marvelous what this man's mind could do. Take a look at this video. The man working on the best project in Florence was Filippo Brunelleschi, and he continued to break boundaries of conventional understanding. He simply saw the world as no other man had. In 1434, Brunelleschi unveiled a new technique that radically changed Western art. He invented perspective. Brunelleschi developed linear perspective, which allowed pictures to create the convincing illusion of a three-dimensional space, where Gothic art is primarily flat, to represent objects as three-dimensional, rounded, solid forms, imitating the appearance of the natural world. Perspective revolutionizes everything. It revolutionizes art, but then, of course, it revolutionizes how we see completely. It creates a modern way of looking, but it begins in the 15th century, and it very much begins under Cosimo with Brunelleschi. Yes, Brunelleschi invented linear perspective, and what does that mean? It means that uh, a painter, to get perspective, that is, the feeling of depth, would go through a mathematical system of laying out the picture. Brunelleschi developed this mathematical system by uh, using a very clever mirror and painting device that he uh, practiced on the baptistry in Florence. And here's a picture showing how he used both the mirror and his painting to uh, uh, create this mathematical system. Here are some types of perspective that we see in painting. 
Uh, one is overlapping, uh, obviously the, the uh, drawing further back is meant to show depth. Diminution, that is it gets smaller as it goes back. Some have vertical or diagonal perspective that is a way of showing some depth. Atmospheric perspective is very common where you see something in the background that is not only smaller but is hazy or fuzzy. And then there's several attempts at mathematical perspective with orthogonals. And then the linear perspective, both one point and two point, that was developed by Brunelleschi. Perspective is a marvelous thing. Let me just show you some examples. Perhaps you've seen something like this in uh, pictures and maybe you've even been lucky enough to see it in person. Here we see a picture of a rather drab wall. It's on some store. And now I'm going to show you a picture of that same wall after a perspective picture has been added. Isn't that amazing? It looks, it, it can't be the same building you say, but it really is. Here's another perspective shot of a street. Isn't that tremendous how you can uh, simulate uh, that stream or that river? And here's another one with a tremendous uh, simulation of a waterfall. These are just marvelous pictures showing perspective. Well, that's part of Brunelleschi's creativity. Upon the death of Cosimo de' Medici, his son Piero took over. Not a good time for the Medici family. Piero was sick and his leadership was brief, but Piero was succeeded by his son Lorenzo the Magnificent, and he was marvelous for the Medicis, but other families hated him. They felt that at this point the Medicis were too powerful. In particular, there was a, f a family that had been very influential that was now shunted into the background, and they were called the Pazzis. The Pazzi family decided that they were going to destroy the Medicis, and therefore they um, solicited and obtained the support of the Pope to kill the Medici brothers, Lorenzo and his brother. The Pope was angry at the Medicis because he wanted forgiveness of some of the debt that the Vatican owed to the Medici bank. The Medicis refused. They told the Pope that he had to pay his debts in, uh, in a normal way. So the Pope and the Pazzis uh, hatched a plan, and the plan is described in this book called April Blood. Very interesting uh, book. Well, what happened is the Pope instructed the priest at the Florence Cathedral to be part of the plan to kill the Medicis. And so on Easter morning, the Medicis and their family came and they sat, of course, on the front row of the cathedral. And as the, as the priest had finished the Mass, he was going to them, of course, and giving them the, uh, the wafer as part of their uh, of the Mass, of their devotion. And as he gave the wafer to Lorenzo's brother, the priest had hidden uh, a dagger, and he stabbed and killed Lorenzo's brother. And then he immediately moved next door to Lorenzo and attempted to kill him. He did stab him, but Lorenzo was able to push past the priest, run across the uh, center part of the cathedral into the area called the sacristy where he shut and bolted the doors and he went up the stairs to a balcony that overlooked the main part of the cathedral and there he showed himself bleeding but alive. The people of Florence were outraged at what the priest had done. They killed the priest, realized that the Pazzis were also involved because they were, they were also trying to kill people and so on and they took the Pazzis down to the center part of the city, uh, the Piazza della Signoria, they held a very brief trial, and then they hung the Pazzis over the edge of the building. Well, Lorenzo de' Medici survived, and he started to gather about him great artists. Some had already been living with the Medici's uh, 
assistants for their art for a couple of generations. One of those would Donatello. Let's just look at three sculptures by Donatello to see how he evolved during this Renaissance period. Here is a picture of Donatello's St. George. It's a nice uh, statue, but it's rather plain and frankly has elements that remind us of medieval sculpture. Look at Donatello's David. He is, uh, first of all, the point that he is nude is would be shocking during the Middle Ages. Certainly would not be, not be done. But he's got a, uh, a rather more modern look to him. He's uh, uh, posed in a, um, a more casual way. And then now look at Donatello's Mary Magdalene. Um, a somewhat grotesque picture, uh, almost a, a terrible feeling associated with Mary Magdalene almost modern, and you can see the evolution in these three sculptures of the work of Donatello. Another early Renaissance artist was Sandro Botticelli. Here we see a magnificent picture by Botticelli. It's called um, Birth of Venus. It's very large painting, probably 10 feet high by 15 12 to 15 feet wide. Um, many people think that this is one of the greatest of all of the Renaissance paintings. They uh, love it. I think that the, uh, the beauty of the face of Venus and uh, most other Botticelli paintings is just marvelous. He's one of the very best in uh, painting faces. Notice something very special here. It's uh, quite obvious. Botticelli uh, used a pagan theme. Venus, remember, is a pagan goddess. That would not have been allowed during the Middle Ages and was barely allowed um, during the Renaissance. But some places like Florence were able to use pagan themes and then move away from the church with these uh, paintings. Botticelli was one of those, but he did not go unchallenged, as we will see in a moment. Notice how classical the pose is. Here we see Botticelli's Birth of Venus compared with what is called the Medici Venus uh, that was uh, sculpted in the first century AD. And you can see the pose is essentially the same. Um, clearly, Botticelli was looking for ancient precedents for his art. Here's another Sandro Botticelli. Uh, this is a beautiful painting. It's actually hung uh, in the same room as the Birth of Venus. It shows the muses and uh, spring and the flowering of uh, uh, the seasons. It's a beautiful painting as well. And again, the beautiful faces on the Botticelli uh, people. Well, now we've seen some Renaissance art, it's time to ask ourselves the question, what was different about Renaissance art than the Middle Ages? Uh, here's a list, realism, perspective, and so on. And this list we can discuss, well, I've already talked about uh, some of them, but I want to show you a line. The line goes after classical and it's identified as pre-Leonardo. Let's talk about those for a moment. Realism. In the Renaissance, things look like they really are in nature. That's part of what Renaissance humanism is all about. It's no longer symbolic. It's really a depiction of real life. Perspective adds to that realism, but we'll consider it as a separate entity because it was invented during this period. And the classical or pagan themes would be another part of Renaissance painting that was not uh, present during the medieval period. Those others, geometrical arrangement, light and shadowing, softening of edges, background, and the artists living from commissions came by way of Leonardo da Vinci, and we'll talk about him in our next lecture. Lorenzo 
the Magnificent died after a reign of a couple of decades. He was succeeded by a priest named Savonarola. Savonarola had been preaching against the Medicis, and when Lorenzo the Magnificent died, his son, Piero No. 2, was a weak ruler, and he was overthrown by the people who supported Savonarola. Savonarola, therefore, drove out the Medicis and took control of the city. He was a tyrant. Uh, he decided that all classical concepts should be eliminated. Things that were non-medieval. Therefore, he encouraged uh, people to destroy their paintings if there was any hint of paganism in them. And we are told that Botticelli himself took some of his paintings and destroyed them. They were destroyed in a bonfire. Uh, there is a book written called The Bonfire of the Vanities that discusses this uh, event. Um, worldliness was also um, attempted to be squashed. Um, Savonarola had gangs of youth who would run through the city and they would tear jewelry off women's uh, necks and maybe even take out their earrings, uh, rip um, fancy parts of their clothes off. Uh, women were encouraged to throw their cosmetics into the fire. All things that seemed to Savonarola to be worldly were to be eliminated. Savonarola's excesses eventually caused the Pope consternation. The Pope commanded Savonarola to stop these excessive actions. Savonarola just simply laughed, said he wouldn't do it. The Pope threatened excommunication. Savonarola then attempted an excommunication of the Pope. I don't think that went very far. And the Pope, of course, then excommunicated Savonarola and had him executed. Uh, here we see a picture of the Piazza della Signoria today. And uh, if you notice, there's a circle on the, uh, on the floor of the, on the ground there in the piazza. And that circle marks the spot where Savonarola was burned. Now, actually, he was hung first, and then he was uh, put onto the stake, and his body was burned in the Piazza della Signoria. Well, that ends, in essence, the Renaissance in Florence. Uh, the Republic came. There were people who supported uh, art during the period of the Republic, the renewal of the Republic. But clearly, the problems of politics and other uh, difficulties uh, made art go away in Florence. It, it had a very difficult time continuing. So we can ask ourselves this question. What should be the role of government in fostering art? Clearly in the case of the Medici family, it was critically important. In ancient Greece, Pericles took the position of the Medici family and fostered art. We could say uh, that the government should do that. How is the U.S. government doing? There are uh, endowments for the humanities that foster art. Some say that the U.S. government's fostering the wrong kind of art. But at least there is some work in uh, uh, art that is being partially sponsored by the U.S. government. What should be the role of the church in fostering art? The Catholic Church was a major sponsor, as we will see in our next lecture. Uh, what is the role of the LDS Church? Actually, it's quite good. Throughout the period of the LDS Church, artists have been encouraged, and at one point in the 1800s, a group of artists were sent to a group of artists was sent to France, where they learned French uh, painting, and then they returned to Utah and practiced their art in Utah. Even today, the church sponsors paintings and uh, uh, other artistic things, writing and poetry, as well as uh, quilts and other interesting sculptures. Should we, like Savonarola, 
actively try to eliminate evil when we see it. Uh, Savonarola was obviously as excessive in his zeal, but I think each person has to ask themselves the question, if you believe something is bad, do you have the personal responsibility of eliminating it? Or is it more appropriate for each person to make up their own mind and uh, choose good or evil for themselves? On the other hand, if you don't eliminate it, then is it possible that the entire society could be corrupted by the evil that you might have been able to get rid of? It's a very difficult problem. I leave that to you to answer. Thank you. Appreciate your uh, attention. Next time, we'll discuss more about the Renaissance.